distinguished guests and ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the High Level Business Roundtable on this Earth Day, April 22nd, to discuss the new direction the US will take on climate change and to help businesses better understand the importance of supporting climate action and implementing net zero 2050 targets. My name is Hee Kyung Son, communications lead of the Global Green Booth Institute. Organized by GGGI and sponsored by the US Embassy in Seoul, we would like to thank you all for joining us virtually and in person. The opening session is being live streamed on Arirang TV's YouTube channel, and we have a small group of participants joining us in person, practicing social distancing. I would like to remind all of you in the room that we require all of you to wear a mask throughout the event for your safety and the safety of others other than the speakers. We have distinguished speakers who will be giving remarks and, and then we will move on to uh, a fireside chat Q&A between our key speakers today. For hygiene purposes, we will give an individual microphone for each of the speaker. Now, without further ado, let me invite our first speaker who needs no introduction. Excellency Ban Ki-moon, President and Chair of GGGI and the eighth Secretary General of the United Nations. He will deliver opening remarks. Let's join me in giving him a big round of applause. Thank you, thank you for your very kind introduction. Honorable Robert Rapson, the Chargeur d'Affaires of the U.S. Embassy in Korea, Excellencies, Ambassadors from the Diplomatic Corps, Director General Frank Weisbormann, Deputy Director General Jenny Kim, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today whether here in person or participating virtually for the high-level roundtable event, which is taking place on this very significant day, Earth Day. Earth Day is a very significant. It reminds us of the importance of planet Earth and of listening to nature's warning. For too long, we have ignored the warnings. In many parts of the world, the severe environment already resembles the setting of the, those apocalyptic science fiction movies. Uh, we must take real actions as a global community if we are to keep global temperatures from rising beyond what the planet can bear. That means 1.5 degrees Celsius before is too long, too, too late. Imagine for a minute, a moment, that our planet can no longer provide us with breathable air, drinkable water, or edible foods. Our existential threat and needs will overshadow human rights, women's rights, voting rights, and all other basic rights and freedoms, our climate is that important. If we, as a global community, fail to act with a sincere urgency, those science fiction movies may cease to look like fiction to our future generations. I keep emphasizing global community quote unquote, because the climate crisis impacts all communities, sectors, and industries, and it will require strong commitments and investment from all of us. Today's focus is on businesses because the private sector is coming to grips with the truth that the climate crisis 
affects them also, and that they can no longer leave this all important issue to governments only. We need urgent commitment and investment from both the politicians and business leaders to lower their emissions and take other climate actions. I am encouraged that many US companies are leading the charge of the co corporate sustainability commitment. These are now almost 300, there are now all, almost 300 companies, including well-known names as, such as Apple, Google, and Microsoft that have joined the RE100 campaign, a global initiative for businesses to commit to 100% renewable energy. Here in Korea, companies like uh, SK, at least the six countries subsidiary companies on the SK, Hanwha Q Cells and LG Chem have announced that they will run some of their operations using renewable energy only. I understand that Hanwha Q Cells became one of the first domestic renewable energy companies to participate in the global campaign to meet 100% of its power demand with renewable energy sources. And that LG Chem committed to powering its operations with 100% renewable energy by 2050. Today's discussions will focus on ways to strengthen corporate sustainability commitments. And I hope the discussions will lead to many more companies to join these efforts. I would also like to point out that as we busily analyze and negotiate mitigation issues and policies, climate adaptation is uh, too often forgotten. Planet Earth is like a huge container of water and it is not going to cool down tomorrow. As a result of commitments made today, we have already put in motion global warming, warning. We therefore need a comprehensive and coherent approach to the climate crisis, looking at both mitigation and adaptation and agricultural adaptation, particularly of those in developing countries where resources are limited, should be an area of concern and high priority. For your information, in fact, I am working currently as co-chairman of this Global Center on Adaptation. As you may remember, uh, January 25th this year, the first summit of uh, adaptation was held while I was working as a co-chairman with the Prime Minister of the Netherlands. About the 40 global leaders uh, participated in this and many ministers and a uh, few hundred scientists participated uh, virtually. Only leaders was missing was President Biden because it was just uh, four days after his inauguration. So he was represented by uh, his uh, special envoy, John Kerry. And uh, this is what uh, I have been emphasizing that while we have really been trying to mitigate, not much, not much has been invested in adaptation. It's about uh, almost nine to one, nine to one. Nine on mitigation, but one adaptation. But now it is very important to invest wisely for future, future shocks. In any way, investing in climate smart agriculture in developing countries are very, very much important. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let, me, let me conclude. Uh, this year's Earth Day comes 
with a bit more optimist, optimism and significance as President Joe Biden of the United States will uh, later today, maybe 12 hours from now, uh, nine, uh, nine or eight hours from now, he has invited at least 40 global leaders, including President Moon of Korea and China and Japan and big, uh, big leaders uh, to a summit meeting commemorating this Earth Day. I hope they will have um, very important and strong commitment announced uh, through this. And therefore, I am very pleased that the GGGI and the United U.S. Embassy here in Seoul are co-hosting this event to mark the return of the United States to global leadership on climate action. As a former UN Secretary General who helped realize the Paris Climate Change Agreement in 2015, I would like to express my deep thanks and satisfaction and extend a warm welcome to the United States on its return to Paris Climate Change Agreement. Return of the United States to Paris Climate Change Agreement has a lot of significance. It is not only climate agreement. It is a return of the United States to multilateralism, where we can work. All the member states of the United Nations will work very closely like they used to uh, before four years ago. Let me also add my own personal feeling on this Earth Day. I have a special uh, reflections and some personal, personal uh, feeling about how I really uh, am grateful to President Joe Biden, but also I'm recollecting my, my memory, what had happened uh, just uh, now, uh, six years ago, six years ago, ten, uh, five years ago, 2016, Earth Day 2016, as soon as Paris climate change was adopted on December 12, 2015 in Paris, I immediately thought how I can make sure that this uh, hard fought, hard negotiated climate change agreement would come, would become effective as soon as possible before I leave my office as a Secretary General. It was just one year left. In, while staying in Paris, I discussed with the key leaders, including John Kerry, who was a State Secretary, Secretary of State, and President Hollande, who was the host of this, and uh, Fabius, Laurent Fabius, who was a chairman or president of this uh, uh, cup, uh, Paris Cup, that we agreed that the following year, April 22nd, the Earth Day, should be the very important moment where we will have a signing ceremony of this document. There was an agreement and adopted, but it has to be signed by authorized emissaries of government representatives, and I designated April 22nd. That's the day. Then I announced that please come to United Nations on Earth Day, and uh, almost all the member states were represented, at least by ministerial level. You will still remember very moving photo where John Kerry, at that time, Secretary of State, was uh, holding in his left hand his uh, granddaughter while signing this uh, Paris Agreement. That was the most moving, moving one. At that time, again, before that, I asked some countries who would have um, much more effective way of ratifying this uh, Paris Agreement. I contacted selectively at least uh, 10 countries, 
including North Korea. Look, you have a much, much better and more effective way of ratifying this document at the parliament. So why don't you bring the instrument of ratification of this Paris Climate Change Agreement to the United Nations when you come for signature. So as soon as you, signature, you sign, then you can deposit me the instrument of ratification. North Korea was one of them. North Korean then Foreign Minister Yi Su-yong came with instrument of ratification. They were far faster than South Korea, in fact. I didn't expect that South Korea would be able to do that at the same time. That is the way, that is the way why we were able to have this Paris Agreement come into force on September, uh, November 4th following year. Another, another good historic moment was when President Obama and the President Xi Jinping of China and I were three of us in Hangzhou, China on the occasion of G20 summit hosted by China. President Xi Jinping invited he and me, him and me, and there, just before the opening of uh, G20 summit meeting, China, who was accounting for 28% of total global greenhouse gas emissions, United States who was accountable for 14%. They presented to me the deposit the ratification papers, official ratification paper. That means United States, China combining together, it accounted for 42% of total glo global greenhouse gas emissions. At the time, we required 55% of global emissions with 55 countries. That was a minimum threshold of Paris Climate Change Agreement being into force. Just after that, two months later, two months later, uh, this historic document became effective, came into force. Just imagine what would happen had we not had this Paris Climate Change Agreement effective by November 4th, then January 20th, following year, President Trump came into power. He just immediately withdrew from that. We might not be able to have a Paris Climate Change Agreement even now. So that was the moment where looking back, I'm still taking a deep breath with sigh of relief. So this is quite historic, again, uh, sorry to have taken much longer time, but Excellencies, dear colleagues, allow me to wrap up by reiterating the urgent need for strong climate commitment and investment from both political and business leaders. I hope today's event will help us to raise climate ambitions much, much higher and collaborate on solutions. And thank you again for joining us today and I wish you all very green and wonderful Earth Day. Thank you very much. Kamsamda. Thank you very much, President and Chair. And next, I would like to invite Excellency Robert Rapson, Chargé d'Affaires at the U.S. Embassy in Seoul, to give uh, welcoming remarks. Join me in giving him a big round of applause. Thank you for that kind introduction. I'm absolutely delighted to be here today. And right up front, special thanks to the GGGI organizers 
for taking good care of all the COVID logistics to make this kind of in-person event possible. So thank you for that. I'd also like to also acknowledge uh, the participation of a distinguished group of Diplomatic Corps members, as well as the senior business executives that are here today. Chairman Vaughn, let me uh, express my deep appreciation to you and the Global Green Growth Institute for organizing this event and inviting me to speak. Your timing is impeccable, as today, of course, is Earth Day, the 51st Earth Day, for those counting. And in just a few hours, it'll be the occasion of President Biden's Climate Change Summit from Washington. First, though, congratulations to GGI on the outstanding work that you do around the globe to deliver a pipeline of bankable green investment projects. In less than a decade, your organization has more than doubled its membership, adding 11 new members since you began your first term as chairman in 2018. Clearly, your experienced leadership is having big impacts, including your campaign for blue skies and the net zero 2050 initiatives. Turning to our work at the embassy, uh, let me just say that with the arrival of the Biden-Harris administration just a few months ago, it's been busy, uh, but a very good busy at that. Last month, as you recall, we had the joint, historic joint visits of the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Defense, which sent a very powerful statement about the enduring strength of our alliance with, the, with Korea and the partnership we enjoy with Korea. I had the benefit of participating in all of those meetings, including the meeting with President Moon, and as Secretary Blinken said at every meeting, it was no accident that they chose Korea and Japan as the first destinations for their first overseas trips. Among the many issues the secretaries engaged in were, of course, our soon-to-be released North Korea policy review, which is coming soon, and our China policy. Secretary Blinken reiterated his now famous maxim, and I think you've heard this, but I'll repeat it, namely that we will be competitive with China where we should, collaborative with China where we can, and adversarial with China where we must. The Secretary is also focused on trilateral cooperation with Japan and its importance, uh, the strengthening coordination between our Indo-Pacific strategy and Korea's new southern policies, and the measures we both need to take to further strengthen our enduring ironclad alliance, our security alliance. And also reflecting the broad and deep dimensions of our growing partnership, they had productive exchanges on democracy and human rights, including what we can do and should do to help restore democracy in Myanmar. They discussed the COVID response effort and vaccine development, secure supply chains, intellectual property protection, promoting trade and science and technology ties, among a long list of multi, a long list of lines of bilateral effort. In sum, clearly what began as a security alliance seven decades ago is now, has become truly now a multifaceted partnership between our two nations, the US and Korea. Most relevant though to today's event, Secretary Blinken also engaged in extensive discussion on climate change. And as you know, Special Envoy John Kerry was just here in Seoul this past weekend uh, to continue our close engagement with the ROK on what the US and ROK, along with other like-minded, can do to catch up, to ratchet up our national ambitions to achieve a, uh, a zero emissions target in 2050. Secretary Kerry was both eloquent and persuasive in his arguments that we all can and must do more to protect our earth and its climate. Let me try to put some more context on this for you. Earlier this week, in a speech at the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, Secretary Blinken generated a stunning list of US weather-related records which make clear that tackling the climate crisis really is an existential issue for the United States. In 2020, the wildfire season burned more than 10 million acres in the US. That's more the entire land in the state of Maryland. In 2020, natural disasters cost the United States around $100 billion. From 2000 to 2018, the American Southwest experienced its worst drought since the 16th century, 16th century. Yet, 2019 was the wettest year on record for the lower 48 states in the US, 
Heavy rains and floods prevented farmers in the Midwest and the Great Plains from planting up to 19 million acres of crops. As Secretary Blinken lamented in the Chesapeake Bay speech, we're running out of records to break. But even with this wealth of evidence of the severity of the climate crisis facing us, as Secretary Blinken noted, the world has already fallen behind on the targets we set six years ago uh, with the Paris Agreement. And we now know those targets didn't go far enough to begin with. With that as the backdrop, later this evening or Thursday morning in Washington, President Moon will join President Biden along with leaders from around the world to underscore the urgency and the economic benefits of much stronger climate action. This summit will also be a key milestone on the road to the United Nations Climate Change Conference COP26 this November in Glasgow. A key goal of both the leaders summit and the COP26 will be to catalyze efforts that keep the 1.5 degree goal within reach. The summit will also highlight examples of how enhanced climate ambition will create good paying jobs, advance in innovative technologies and help vulnerable countries adapt to climate impacts. We will work with our ally, the Republic of Korea, as well as other countries and partners to put the world on a sustainable climate pathway. The United States is moving quickly to build resilience, both at home and abroad, against the impacts of climate change. The climate crisis is at the center of our foreign policy and national security, as Secretary Blinken emphasized this past Monday in his speech. More specifically, though, the United States is committed to achieving a carbon pollution-free power sector by 2035. This includes ensuring that the U.S. federal government itself is using 100% renewable energy by 2035 and dramatically improving waste management and energy efficiency in our global operations around the world. We hope that Korea can move quickly as well, especially in announcing a more ambitious NDC target, ending public financing of overseas coal projects and reducing its domestic coal usage. We are pleased at the rapid pace of cooperation with Seoul, but we both recognize we all need to do more. Here at the U.S. Embassy, we'll be doing our small part to integrate climate objectives across all of our programs in 2021. At the centerpiece of our public diplomacy efforts, we are establishing the Embassy's own climate action network called UDI Earth. That's right, UDI Earth. You can find the UDI Earth network and sign up on the U.S. Embassy's homepage. And when you join, we'll provide you with information, informa invitations to events, and various opportunities to engage with us as we prioritize uh, climate, uh, climate issues. In closing, if the past year of the COVID-19 pandemic has taught us anything, it's that global, rep global problems require global solutions. And climate change is most definitely a global problem of extraordinary proportions demanding extraordinary global solutions. These problems do not respect national boundaries and require countries around the world to work together to find and implement these solutions. And of course, that's one reason we're here today. So thank you. I wish GGGI the best of success going forward. Happy Earth Day, Udi Earth. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I would like to give the floor to our last speaker of the opening session. Dr. Frank Reisperman, Director General of the Global Green Group Institute, will give remarks. Uh, after his remarks, we will move on to the fireside chat Q&A between the key speakers. Uh, Mr. Ba uh, sorry, uh, Mr. Dr. Frank Reisperman uh, will be the moderator of the Q&A session. So now over to you. Much, Mikyung, President Chairman, Honorable Associate of Air Ambassadors, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm tempted to say Happy Earth Day as you close, but I'm not quite sure that is appropriate given the current state of affairs. I think uh, Mother Earth is in deep crisis. We're experiencing. Uh, sustainability crisis as I think never before. I was watching some videos this morning with my family before coming to work 
on the crisis that affects our oceans, fish, plastic. You know, COVID and climate are just the most visible symptoms of this deeper sustainability crisis that affects uh, our natural environment. And indeed that we can't quite celebrate Earth Day, but indeed uh, at least reflect on the state of affairs and hope to do better for our, for our children and grandchildren. I do want to thank uh, the Chargé d'Affaires, Robert Robson, for his kind remarks about uh, GDGI. Uh, and of course, uh, I would like to, uh, if it wasn't already clear, make it very clear that you have a standing invitation as uh, the United States government to join GDGI. Uh, and we're certainly very pleased to have this first joint event with you uh, on this occasion and hope to have many more uh, in return. So in February 2019, here in Seoul, we experienced a few days of very serious air pollution. And I think that was a turning point. It sort of catapulted the issue to the top of the agenda for the public and for government. Because in fact, air pollution kills as many as 7 million people every year. That's an incredible number. That's more than all wars combined. It's many more than COVID. But somehow it doesn't inspire the same drastic action that COVID has. Uh, air pollution is a, is a silent killer, like many other environmental impacts. And we've come to accept that when we watch out of our windows in our nice apartments here in Seoul, we can't see the mountains as if that was normal. Of course it is not. And indeed, also in 2019, IPCC came together here in Korea to finalize and issue its one and a half degree centigrade report. And that report concluded that as humanity, we have a very short and shrinking window of time left to take decisive action. And that was in a way at the heart of then starting this race to net zero by 2050 that is now inspiring so many governments and the private sector to try and come together to avoid the worst of climate impacts. Because as you, you were noting, Mr. Rapson, already we are experiencing many climate impacts, particularly in the kind of member countries GI is working in, in least developed countries that have maybe the same climate impacts, but much less capa capacity, much less capability to avoid or to act. So yes, in late 2019, GGI and our partner, the Climate Change Center here in Korea, initiated this campaign for blue, sh blue skies and net zero 2050 to build awareness of these twin issues and also to build public support for taking more ambitious action. And we've done this by organizing events like this, uh, often involving our colleagues from the embassies where sometimes they could share experience from back home where in Denmark, for instance, uh, the private sector is fully behind government in taking those actions rather than sort of stepping on the brake. And yes, uh, we are very pleased that by now we have 43 partner organizations, many of them embassies in Korea, but also Korean NGOs and more and more Korean private sector organizations, the Chambers of Commerce of the EU, the American Chamber of Commerce in Korea, the Australian Chamber of Commerce, Pepper Savings Bank, LG Energy Solutions. And this year we will really focus the campaign on bringing on board more private sector companies and like today, sharing more of the experience of private sector companies of why they believe that it's not just CSR, frankly, it's core to the strategy of those companies to focus on being more sustainable going forward. So yes, 2020 was supposed to be the year in which countries made more ambitious commitments to climate action under the Paris Agreement and then COVID hit and everything changed. From GDGI's green growth perspective, it's a good thing that so many have recognized that COVID-19 is a sign that our economic model is not sustainable and that so many have called for building back better, not just trying to recover what was there before the pandemic, but actually using these many trillions that have been mobilized by governments to build back better. Unfortunately, 
despite good signs like the EU Green New Deal or the Korean Green New Deal or many green elements in President Biden's stimulus plan, overall the analysis of the 15 plus trillions of dollars that have been mobilized by governments to recover from the pandemic are not green. They are still brown. So we do risk just after, like after the financial crisis in 2008, 2009, when there was a brief dip in emissions and some hopeful green elements to the stimulus plans, by and large the stimulus was brown and emissions went straight back up. So that is the critical risk and that's why this is potentially a tipping point. We're of course very happy that there were so many net zero pledges last year, including from President Moon in October. But now we need to see stronger action to have confidence that those net zero targets will actually be reached. Because based on analysis of the UN earlier this year, we are not on track to meet the NDCs as they were submitted in 2015. And as you just commemorated, those NDCs were not good enough to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement. So yes, today on Earth Day, we're in the middle of a deep sustainability crisis and the eyes of the world are on Washington DC's Climate Leader Summit where we hope the Biden administration will make a clear commitment to a more ambitious NDC. And that will then no doubt raise the pressure on other governments, including in Korea, to follow suit. So we sincerely hope the Korean government will announce a more ambitious NDC as well. That together with the Green New Deal and credible policies to give confidence that the net zero 2050 target will be met, will put Korea really in a position of leadership in Asia. The government will not be able to do this alone. A growing role, we think, will need to be played by the Korean private sector. And that's why we're focusing events in the campaign now more on the role of the private sector. We hope to see many more Korean companies sign up to RE100 and more generally join the race to net zero, as I think both other speakers have said. Climate action can go hand in hand with green recovery and with the fight for blue skies. Just a day before yesterday, the World Resources Institute released a county by county level analysis of US clean energy jobs that shows that clean energy has become an economic growth engine generating new green jobs, particularly in rural, less wealthy counties. Exactly what we need for green recovery. I think arguments like that, and GDGI has published studies that that is also true for emerging economies like Indonesia and Mexico, are at the heart of our argument that the recovery can and should be green. We do think that Korea has an important leadership role to play, not just domestically, of course, domestically through decisive action to reduce emissions and build a resilient green economy, but also in other Asian economies that are significant emitters of greenhouse gases, strong partners of Korea, and that have not yet committed to net zero. So with its significant private sector investment in countries like Vietnam and Indonesia, and as more Korean companies sign up to RE100, the Korean government and the Korean private sector together can work hand in hand to power past coal, both here and throughout Asia. Korean technology exports should really no longer include building coal-fired power plants, but can provide renewable energy technology, sustainable transportation technology, electric or hydrogen vehicles, battery swapping solutions, smart grid solutions, many good clean and green technologies in which Korea is leading as well. So yes, we th think there's an important role for the private sector. We hope you'll discuss that with us in this panel today uh, and with support of government, just like the government in the past supported those coal-fired power plants that probably would not have been built without Korean government support. There should also be support from government for those new green projects. And indeed, we are pleased to see that there are some early commitments to green Korea's official development assistance that is still not very green, but hopefully more in line with the Green New Deal will become much more green going forward. And then there are many good opportunities to support green investments. And of course, the Green Climate Fund here in Korea 
and GDGI look forward to be partners with you to help shape such green investment projects and bring together green and climate finance to realize such good investment projects. So with that, I hope we'll have an interesting discussion here today. Looking forward to working closely with all of you and thank you for being here. Now, as the moderator, the MC already announced, I have a bit of a dual role. Uh, can I now turn to our two key speakers today and ask you both a couple of questions? I think you are indicating you are prepared for that. So can we start with you, our President and Chairman Saban? Can you reflect on the path of the world? Is the world on track to a net zero 2050 target? Uh, I think it will not be only me, uh, but most of you may have same views that uh, our world is not doing enough to meet all this uh, current rapidly changing uh, climate uh, phenomena. Uh, this, my message as while working at the United Nations was already, uh, you started already uh, 15 years ago, now by this time, I have been repeatedly saying that uh, we have to raise the level of ambition. Uh, first, I think a political level ambition uh, should be very important. Uh, but I have not seen many leaders who have been strongly committed. Even though the politicians do not enjoy much respect uh, from uh, people around the world. I, I'm sorry to say this. I saw all global phenomena that the political leaders are not respected, but we cannot also work without a strong engagement and leadership of a political, at the political level. This is what we are now beginning to see. The President Biden has taken as his uh, first presidential act on the very day of inauguration, he signed to rejoin the Paris Climate Change Agreement. Even though under heavy pressure uh, from European Union and Americans, uh, President Moon also had declared a carbon neutrality by 2050. My impression was that uh, he was, you know, uh, cornered, cornered by, you know, why Secretary Kerry would be here, why Alok Sharma, COP26 uh, chairman, would be here twice already. So it is true that the South Koreans were under heavy uh, pressure. And I myself, as a chairman of a National Council on Climate and Air Quality, have been pushing very hard, very hard, brushing my face to Korean government, leaders, prime minister, and president, presidential chief of staff, and the minister of uh, industries. And so now I think uh, quite a number of countries are committed, but the word is not important. Word is not important. We have to make sure that this uh, decarbonization, carbon neutrality uh, should be achieved by 2050 by any means. Now, it cannot be done only by political leaders. Of course, political leaders, they set the guidelines and ask the business communities, then business communities should also change their behavior. Most of the Korean industries, and particularly those countries who have risen from uh, uh, developing state status to developed status, they have been largely depending on easy, easy way of energy, like uh, mostly coal, coal. Thus, I have proposed and recommended and accepted by Korean government that by 2035, there should be no 
cars who will be run with uh, internal combustion energy. Then there should be no coal fired power stations by 2045. Of course, this has been uh, met by a lot of uh, criticisms and repercussions, but Korean government has made it. So uh, early May, early May, the Korean government's very powerful uh, carbon neutrality commission will be launched. Even though I'll be stepping down my current uh, chairmanship uh, Friday, by the end of April, that's the Friday, uh, but I will use all my tools under me. Uh, I'm, uh, instead of this uh, GGGI, I'm now chairman and president of this GGGI. I'm also chairman, co-chairman of the Global Center on Adaptation. And there are many, I'm also deputy chair of the elders. This is a group of uh, political leaders, presidents, and Nobel laureate. So we will use on a moral basis, moral basis and political basis to really emphasize the importance of uh, leaders to taking action. I hope uh, your excellencies ambassadors here should really recommend to your government leaders that uh, you must be on the road. Otherwise, this will not happen by 2050. What I have been doing as Secretary General, I really hope, I, I really decided that to lead by example, I'm not a scientist, I'm not an economist, I'm a just a political science, you know, uh, I measure political science, but I just wanted to lead by example, show what, ask, ask the people to follow what I am doing. I first uh, went to Antarctica and Arctic zones, I think altogether five times. If there is anybody who has been to Arctic zones five times, please come out. <laughs> that risks a lot of difficulties and even challenges and safety. But standing on the melting Arctic ice, melting ice, I was speaking out to the world that the, this Arctic zone, Arctic ice is melting, sea level is rising. We have to make sure that uh, we have to contain global temperature rise below 1.5 degrees Celsius. Otherwise, uh, there will be no hope for our succeeding generations. And I have been really challenging them that it is your political as well as a moral responsibility to leave this planet Earth and our humanity a sustainable way. Otherwise, you will be blamed in the history. So I can only say in, in such a political way, uh, but we have to ask our business leaders. Last week, I was in POSCO, in Pohang. Why? Because I was told by many people who are not believing in carbon neutrality. Look, Mr. Chairman, this POSCO cannot, cannot do by 2050. And I met the Hyundai chair. Then they are now, they are now determined to do it. I met, uh, I met twice in this POSCO. Once in Seoul, once down in uh, Pohang. Lecture them strongly that you must lead this campaign. They are ready to do that. And Hyundai and Kia, they are going to uh, stop the producing, uh, you know, internal engines, internal en combustion engines by 2035. And uh, many companies are now joining this, what is known as RE 100% campaign. So we have to raise a political ambition mobilize a financial and science and technology support for many countries who would need it. And thirdly, we have built and forged a much stronger 
global partnership, government, business, and civil society. I think civil society people can also uh, play a very important role. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ivan. It's wonderful to have such a passionate champion for the cause in you. Now, Mr. Rapson, I think you understand, we understand that the Biden administration will probably launch a new US NDC. We're all curious, of course. Can you give us a teaser? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Uh, almost an existential question. Um, I don't have the president's talking points uh, in front of me in, uh, for the summit in about, s I think it's six hours. It's uh, 8 a.m. in Washington, the, 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 the summit will kick off. But I think uh, the very informed speculation is that indeed we will, uh, we will announce some very ambitious targets. Um, and the president will take opportunity to explain how uh, we can get there. Not all the details, of course, but enough to give credibility to what he is uh, projecting in terms of our NDC targets. You know, um, it, it didn't uh, take more than an hour or two last weekend with John Kerry for me to absorb the big picture and many of the details because if there is an impassioned uh, advocate, a statesman, you know, a diplomat, a politician, a, uh, a climate wonk, if, uh, if I could put it that way, it, it, it is John Kerry and he just exudes confidence and uh, Again, I, I learned a lot in just the space of an hour in his meetings with the foreign minister and with the minister of environment. But what he did say up front, of course, is that we're not on track, clearly not on track to hit these targets, but we can get on track. It's gonna require a huge effort, uh, a concerted effort among governments, private sectors, civil society, uh, the haves and have nots globally. Uh, we have to make more than just the extra effort. We have to go way beyond uh, where we are now. So we hope we can lead by some example, but it's going to require examples from others as well. And Korea, of course, is an important uh, leader. Uh, what Korea does uh, has resonance in many other parts of the world. And if Korea can step up along with a handful of other key partners, uh, I think, you know, Mr. Kerry was optimistic we could move in the direction of being where we need to be. But it's going to be the next six years, he put it, it out are the, are the most important because if we don't get on track now, we can't do it down the road. So this next two, three, four, five years is, is critically important. And he described the, uh, uh, you know, the inflection point here as almost in tectonic terms. This is the potentially the biggest change in how we organize, how our societies, our economies are organized since the Industrial Revolution. The potential is there and we'll be counting on the private sector to generate those technologies that don't exist yet or at least not formed to carry us into the 2050 target that allow us to reach those 2050 targets. So if we don't do it together, we can't do it at all. And I think that's been his core message and President Biden, I think will echo that loudly today in about uh, six hours. Yes. <laughs> well, we didn't quite think you'd give us the number, but I think that was a very good teaser of what we can expect. Mr. Ban, if President Biden sets uh, a clear new commitment, how important do you think that is for other countries and for the Paris Agreement? Of course, the United States is not the only country in this world, but you know, reality, you know, we have to look at the reality. It is the United States who can lead this campaign with a strong commitment. Uh, then I think there's a much, much way that uh, people, you know, the other countries can follow. It's not the only United States I believe that uh, they have to work very closely with the China and India, uh, they are, and if possible, Russia too. They are most of the, one of the uh, five or six, uh, the biggest the emitters, emitters. In case of India, they may need much, much more support while Chinese, uh, they think they can do it on their own because in fact, they are doing a lot. I know that uh, President Biden and the President Xi Jinping, you know, according to all these reports, uh, have a lot of uh, differences in uh, political differences on human rights and some other uh, governance issues. 
But my recommendation is that uh, as President Obama uh, worked with the President Biden uh, to uh, first of all address this uh, global issue of humanity, it's not, it has nothing to do with the ideology or political system. If uh, China and the United States can really uh, work harmoniously on climate issues and other issues, uh, then I think there will be certainly a way, certainly a way where they can find much better atmosphere or scope of uh, trust that can be formed. This is um, some leadership challenges President Biden may face at this time. Now he's been speaking out, uh, speaking out, against all this China. At the same time, he's asking support from cooperation from President uh, Xi Jinping. I understand that he's uh, going to participate in uh, all the day, uh, summit, the uh, summit. So let us hope uh, for the best. Uh, but basically, American leadership will be crucially important. That is why uh, you know, I'm really counting on his leadership. I worked very closely with uh, then Vice President Biden, uh, who was a team of uh, President uh, Obama. Uh, so I have a full and high trust in his leadership, in his uh, way of uh, addressing very delicate, challenging issues in a harmonious way. That's my, my hope. Again, uh, at the same time, with this, with, with the United States return to climate regime, this means that multilateralism, we can expect much more. The multilateralism, global cooperation can be expected under leadership of President uh, Biden. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I had one final question for you. Would you want to respond to this, well, I think? No, I'll just jump in and add to what yeah. uh, Chairman Bond said. And as I mentioned in my remarks, of course, you know, there is, there is tension in the, our relationship with China, undoubtedly. We, we see it expressed in so many ways. But uh, if you recall what I said about the three aspects, of the dimensions of our engagement uh, with China, competitive certainly, uh, adversarial where we have to be, but collaborative where we can be. And this is the collaborative issue uh, for our two countries. And the two of us together, if we can work collaboratively, can make a difference. John Kerry's visit there you know, was not an accident uh, last week. He went there for a specific purpose to see what the boundaries of collaboration might be. And the, the report that President Xi will be participating is encouraging. Still a first step, but encouraging. Uh, the second piece I just wanted to mention was that the, the large uh, infrastructure package that the Biden administration has proposed, the $2 trillion infrastructure package, has a lot, I mean, a lot of money in it that if not directly focused on climate change has impacts related to climate change. And uh, I think the Biden administration has been very upfront that they're gonna put uh, our, you know, our money where our mouth is, uh, to put it bluntly. And I think this is a big, uh, a big development that should be uh, helpful for other countries as they look to see, you know, can they afford, we cannot uh, not afford to do this, but the American government is putting that money out there this happen in the United States, but also would benefit globally. That already is a bit of a bridge to the last question I had for you, Mr. Rapson, which is also a link to our next uh, uh, panel. Uh, even the last few years when, let's say, the federal government wasn't quite pushing the climate issue, the private sector in the U.S. was actually quite proactive and leading in RE100 and other similar initiatives. Could you speak to the motivation of the private sector to actually step up and maybe even be ahead of government on climate issues? Well, you know, the private sector is motivated by profit, of course. Uh, you can't deny that. Um, and at the end of the day, though, you know, they see profit opportunities out there. If we can, if we can hit the targets uh, and generate the technologies and allow us to hit the targets, the potential for growth, prosperity is enormous, but it's a risk. Uh, it looks like some companies are starting to take that risk. 
uh, GM, I think, has announced that it will go to all electric vehicles uh, at some fixed point, maybe in the next 10 years, 2030 or 2035. Uh, at the start, it's only one company, but it could be symptomatic of a, of a mindset that will take hold as governments commit fully and deeply, both rhetorically as well as, uh, you know, fiscally uh, and programmatically. So, again, uh, we're starting to see some synergies build, but we still have a long way to go. Thank you. I think that will be the question that we'll be digging deeper in with our next panel when we talk to Korean private sector companies on how they see that. But for this, I think I'd like to uh, have you join me in thanking our two key speakers for their contributions and their willingness to answer questions. And I found that fascinating, and I hope you found that too. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now, given the current situation with COVID-19, uh, we decided to not hold a big group photo session. So if we can just ask uh, Dr. Frank Reisman, uh, Mr. Bon, and also uh, Mr. Rapson and uh, Ms. Jenny Hyun Kim to come forward for a, a photo op, um, that would be much appreciated.
thank you for joining us for the panel discussion of the high-level business roundtable event on this Earth Day. Now, I would like to invite the moderator of the panel discussion, Kyoon Jenny Kim, Deputy Director General and Head of Green Growth Planning and Implementation Division. Now, over to you, Jenny. Thank you, Higyeong. Ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, uh, this is Jenny Kim, Deputy Director General of Global Green Growth Institute, and I'm very pleased to, to moderate this session with uh, representatives from Korea's private sector and expert organization regarding sustainability and green growth. So global climate diplomacy landscape is changing rapidly. The US and China have committed to work together last weekend during special envoy Kerry's visit to China. And this is indeed boosting hopes of a global deal on greenhouse gas emission reduction this year, casting a huge implication to private sector. Actually, three days ago, Financial Times reported that BP Big banks like uh, Goldman Sachs, HSBC, BNP Paribas, and 24 other global banks are coming under pressure from a coalition of large investors to stop financing carbon intensive projects and to scale up their green lending. President Biden, who brought back the United States to Paris Climate Agreement, is hosting Climate Summit today inviting 40 other world leaders, including President Moon. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres urged the world to pledge no more coal power plant construction and coal phase out entirely uh, by 2040. P4G summit to be held in May in Seoul will also play the stepping stone role to raise the ambition at Glasgow COP26. Therefore, all these changes in climate diplomacy landscape is providing both challenges and opportunities to the private sector. Therefore, I'm very pleased that today we can discuss how private sector can effectively address these challenges and opportunities. We invited panelists from front runner companies in Korea and organizations. Dr. Kim Sung-woo from law firm Kim and Jung is with us to make a presentation on net zero implication to business. I don't think I needed to introduce him in detail because he is one of the champion, uh, he's one of the champions regarding green business in Korea and his book published <laughs> in 2018 titled Coal Business Saving the Earth this is a steady seller in Korea. After Dr. Kim's presentation, we have three panelists for discussion. So Mr. Cha Munhwan, Executive Vice President from Hana QSEL, and Madam Chung Inhee, Sustainability Expert Advisor from AG Chemicals. And we have Ms. Lee Su Gyeong, Senior Researcher from Green Technology. Center. So I would like to invite Dr. Kim Sung Woo first for your presentation regarding corporate strategy in net zero and ESG weather. You have 10 minutes. Thank you, Jenny, for very kind and su surprising um, introduction. Um, well, it's, I would like to thank um, the GGGI and U.S. Embassy for inviting me here. It's a great honor for me to um, give a presentation from private sector perspective. Um, the many, many people curious about the, what's the relationship between the Kim and Jung, which is the biggest law firm in Korea, with, and, and, and um, Net Zero. So we have um, advised the corporates and, and investors um, on decarbonization strategy renewable energy investment, and ESG engagement. Based on that experience, um, I would give just short um, the presentation on what does net zero mean for businesses to draw out some topic for the discussion after my presentation. Um, oops. As we heard, um, I, there are consecutive summits within this year 
regarding environment and, and uh, climate. And we are expecting um, some ambitious results from tonight from US and next month the P4G summit will be held in Korea. And after G7 and G20, we'll, we'll um, finally um, have some agreement on voluntary cooperation on um, the, the Paris Agreement. These will give, uh, and this should give um, clear long-term signal to the private sector to change the strategy or to decide investment on in this, the, the um, zero carbon economy. Uh, I do have 27 year experience in environment and energy and I haven't seen this kind of fast shift of last year, 18 month. Um, as he said, um, the, the, the only 25% of the world had a decarbonization horizon 18 months ago, but now it's 75%. So that's a, that's a shift that we are looking at right now and, and all, even the carbon price backs up that, that big shift that I have never seen. Just one year ago, the, the Euro EU ETS, European the car carbon credit price was around 20, 20 euro, but now it's 44 euro um, in, in April. So that's, that's, a sh that's backing up the big shift. Why? Um, as we just mentioned, earlier, the U.S. returns to the climate debate, and it really impacts a lot, and it really impacts a lot to the international society, and it, it really impacts a lot to the, to the business people as well, because if you can see that it, it means the ambi more ambitious target, and it means extending and, and expanding tax credit for renewable energy, so, we, so that we can um, consider to, to, to decide investment as a private sector, and also, uh, the climate bill was submitted um, for the clean power sector to decarbonize the power plants. And um, the SEC announced um, to amend the 10-year-old the climate change disclosure guideline, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it, it's closely related to the, to the, to the private, private sector. Um, and, and also the China joined to be carbon neutral. And there are many, many reasons that the China, which consumes more than half of entire the coal consumption in the world, um, there are many reasons for China to declare um, the carbon neutral. But one of the, I think one of the reasons is the, the China has uh, confidence in techno technology, related technology to decarbonize the economy. And I'll just get back to that in a minute. And the European Green Deal, it's, 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 it's not a new, new uh, for us. It's been a year they declare the, the New Deal. Uh, but if you just first click into their, its website, it says the, the Green Deal is the plan to make EU's economy sustainable um, rather than saving the planet. So we see, as a private sector, we see the, the green and, and, and the net zero and carbon neutral is being mainstreamed and it's being prioritized within the countries and especially in major ones. So um, we, I think it, it, it just gives a, the big signal uh, for us to change something, but we don't know yet what, what to change and when to change. Um, so if we want to know what to change and when to change, let's just take a look at what, what it looked like, uh, the, the zero carbon economy in 2015. At left circle is the, the final energy mix of today. And right circle is the final energy mix of zero carbon economy in 2050. The biggest change that we have to note is the portion of electricity. The portion of electricity is today 19% and it will be increased into almost 70% um, for the zero carbon economy. It means if we just successfully, um, the, the, 
arrive in the zero carbon economy, we will we will have a lots of electricity to meet our energy demand. Then, my first answer for the, the presentation title: What does it mean for businesses? Is is, is green racing? If the zero carbon economy consumes lots of electricity. Some business has to design that electricity. Some business has to build. Some business has to develop. Some business has to operate. Some business has to in invest. If one business does not do it, others will do it. So it means to us, it is green racing. It's already started. If I just take a look at, if you just take a look at this slide, I just took an example of EV battery installment ranking, company ranking as of now, and solar PV module output volume ranking by company and country, which companies belong to, company belongs to, and wind turbine installation. There are, there are many, um, the, the, the top 10, among the top 10 uh, companies and countries you see the diversity and, and also dominance of the ranking. That will change, I'm pretty sure, that that's, that's the nature of the competition within, the, within um, the industry. So it means green racing for us. It's not, it's not only, uh, it's, it's not the, the, the country only thing to declare carbon neutral. As you can see from this slide, the businesses started to declare carbon neutral again um, since 2019, very rapidly. So last year, um, I, I, if I remember correctly, on Environment Day, the UN launched Race to Zero to bring um, the, the businesses to declare net zero altogether under the common standard under EU, UN, I'm sorry. Um, at that time, it was less than 10, net less than 1,000 companies, but now it's, it's more than 2,000 companies. So it's, it's getting bigger. Even the companies, the number of companies declaring net zero. But we have to take a look at the reason that um, the companies are declaring the, the carbon neutral. We don't know, we, I'm not, I'm not, I don't think that the, business sector has very clarity on the speed of carbon neutrality and, and, and the certainty of that. We still have some ambiguity on it, but we declare the carbon neutral because we have to manage a stakeholder. We have to manage a shareholder. There are lots of requests from the shareholder, investors and, and, and the stakeholders. We have to manage it. It's not, it's not the option for business, it's the must for business. So one of the examples that I can took is the Climate Action 100 Plus, that's the biggest initiative um, among the ESG or stakeholder management initiative. It it's represents almost 600 investors with the AUM 54 trillions and the, it launched a five year long initiative to engage with 167 companies amounting to 80% of entire global um, the emission uh, within the industry. So what they do is, is with the Climate Action 100 Plus ask the companies to set the reduction target and disclose the data and implement the governance which clearly articulates the board's accountability. So they just have that, they have done that to their investees, to their, their companies they invest in. And after they started that initiative, the result was over 70% of 160 companies established the reduction plan. And more surprisingly, um, as of last year, 43% said net zero by 2050 target. So some of the, in, some of the business sector declare the net zero voluntarily, but some of the business sector had to declare because of ESG, because of the shareholder management, because of ESG management, because of stakeholder management. 
how do stakeholders want ESG from active communication to shareholder resolution to litigation sometime to divestment. One of the examples that I can took is the, the shareholder resolution, 13 investors including Amundi filed the shareholder resolution asking HSBC to reduce financing on fossil fuels. And there are a bunch of examples like that. So the, the company, if they agree on carbon neutral or not, if they love it or not, if they um, like it or not, you know, it, this is something that company has to do it, stakeholder management. So my second um, the answer for the question of what does net zero mean for businesses is, is stakeholder management. Since the stakeholders are asking, we have to manage it anyway. Um, the one, of, one of the chart that I'm, that I'm showing through this slide is it relates to the valuation of the company. The blue line represents S&P Global Clean Energy Index and red one is S&P 500 index, which is benchmark. So as you heard a lot of news related to this, this the clean energy index outperforms the benchmark. And not, this is not the always this case, but, but it happens a lot. So we now recognize the, the possibility, high possibility that long-term high possibility for to have a better valuation if we manage stakeholder properly aligned with carbon neutral. My last slide. So the conclusion is what does um, the, the net zero mean for business? Number one, green racing. Number two, stakeholder management. And as you can see from this graph, the money flows into uh, to ESG sector. That's 40.5 trillion dollars as of uh, last year. That's one third of globally professionally management entire asset. I think where money goes, where sustainability lies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kim. Uh, thank you for your insightful presentation with a lot of numbers data and examples to convince us that decarbonization, carbon neutrality in business is not an option, it's something must do um, as a irreversible global trend. So thank you for uh, your, your, your work. And now I would like to invite uh, the representatives from private sector who are who stand on the front line of green business. So first of all, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Cha from Hanwha QCell. Yes, as far as I understand, Hanwha QCell is a leading renewable energy company in Korea. It is also participating in RE100 campaign. So please tell us why Hanwha QCell actually decided to join RE100 campaign and how to develop your company's strategy to achieve this goal. Okay, thank you for the question. Um, uh, let me uh, let me start uh, uh, the uh, the introduction of Hana QCell to you. Um, Hana QCell is a uh, the uh, module solar module uh, manufacturer, and then uh, we are also doing some uh, uh, construction solar farm construction business in the world. Uh, the, uh, we are the uh, number one in uh, residential and commercial uh, solar industry mm -hmm. in, uh, in uh, very uh, advanced countries like uh, in the US and EU and Australia, Japan, Korea. So uh, uh, that is uh, our uh, business. So for your question, um, as uh, Dr. Kim uh, mentioned that uh, actually you know, we, uh, we decided to participate in the, uh, in, uh, the RE100, uh, uh, mostly because of the ESG. Yeah. Um, the, uh, so for example, uh, our customers wants, to, uh, uh, wants us to make a, a solar module without 
the uh, fossil fuel or without the uh, carbon emission, something like that. So uh, that is the, the first reason. And then the second one is that as a kind of renewable uh, company, uh, we want to promote the world to move forward the uh, low carbon emission uh, the environment. So uh, we should uh, uh, lead all the uh, such, uh, we should uh, make some initiative on that. So that is the, the reason. So uh, after that, I mean, the after today or after several years later, uh, maybe this kind of uh, uh, solar, I mean, the, uh, sorry, uh, this kind of uh, carbon uh, net zero uh, uh, the, uh, campaign or R800, maybe the, uh, give us some, uh, some big threat, so big challenges. Uh, for example, uh, the EU right now considering to uh, impose the uh, solar, uh, I mean the uh, carbon uh, border tax, mm -hmm. meaning that when we, uh, uh, as a solar uh, module manufacturer, we have uh, uh, many, uh, many uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, factories around the world, uh, like in Korea, and also we have factory in China and Malaysia and the US. So we are purchasing the solar panels and then we export that those panels to the around the globe. So if uh, you, EU imposed the uh, solar uh, border tax, then uh, we should uh, make our solar panel uh, without any carbon, uh, without any carbon. So that, that means that, uh, that means uh, without you know, uh, uh, complying uh, with such a uh, measure, we cannot uh, sell uh, our module to the country. And also, for example, in, uh, in, in France, they introduced a CFT uh, policy, which is a carbon footprint policy. And then uh, they graded all the uh, solar modules and uh, according to the, uh, the, the carbon, uh, carbon contained in their in their part and in their modules in their cables something like that, and then they graded uh, every modules uh, according to their uh, criteria. So uh, uh, so if uh, we want to sell the the, uh, the module to France, then we should uh, comply with their uh, policy. And also, uh, for example, like a big companies like uh, as a Samsung uh, Bang uh, Moon told uh, you know, the uh, big companies like Apple, Google, and Microsoft, they want us to provide a very clean, I mean, the, the very clean uh, carbon neutral uh, modules to their uh, project. So uh, we also ask our contractors or our subcontractors to provide us the without any, uh, I mean, the, the carbon neutral uh, part to us. So that is uh, uh, one of the, the threat. If we don't comply with that you know, policy, then we're gonna lose our, you know, in the competition. But uh, uh, I think uh, the threat is also the uh, opportunity. So, so if we uh, very much comply with that, uh, that the policy or their carbon neutral policy, then we're gonna have uh, many business opportunities. Like um, uh, even though we, expand our manufacturing business in several countries. Uh, we also uh, have a big opportunity to install the module, meaning that uh, we're gonna increase our, for example, employment rate mm -hmm. and uh, create a lot of jobs. And uh, uh, for example, if uh, Korea, uh, Korea has a, a such uh, opportunity and then uh, we're gonna expand our you know, solar manufacturing or I installation of solar panels, then our grid, electricity grid, is uh, pretty much becomes uh, like uh, vulnerable to the, to the instability of uh, kind of uh, solar uh, power because, or wind power. So uh, to, to stabilize a grid, uh, we need a kind of battery system, right? Then battery needs, uh, then we need uh, some software to operate the batteries. And uh, with the batteries, we have uh, create another business like a, a virtual power plant or demand response or frequency regulation or something like that. Then that 
create a lot of uh, software businesses in Korea or in the U.S. somewhere. To mostly to, uh, in order to uh, devalize the grid, then we should uh, forecast the weather. Mm. The, the you, you can see the uh, the uh, cloud uh, cloud picture through the satellite, right? And then you can see the uh, clouds moving to Korea, right? Then uh, 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 then solar uh, generation, solar electricity generation comes down. And sometimes uh, wind uh, come very, comes to Korea very, uh, very fast, sometimes very slow, sometimes with very uh, a lot of humidity or something like that. Then it causes a lot of uh, you know the the differences in the electricity generation. So how can we predict or how can we forecast such sort of uh, you know fluctuation? The, these days. Uh, uh, many guys in the U.S., the Silicon Valley, and then the Korea, Korea they try to you know, forecast the, the, the such you know, fluctuation through AI, machine learning, and some other like optimization. So um, some some softwares. I mean that kind of opportunity. If we win the win the such competition, or whatever, if we, if we are very successful in that, you know, making the, the very good high tech uh, software, then we can uh, we can uh, generate a lot of jobs, and then we can um, compete ar around the globe. And also, uh, such cheap electricity, people may think uh, in the solar uh, solar uh, generated uh, electricity or wind generated electricity must be very expensive, but I, you know. I tell you that uh, it's uh, one of the cheapest uh, mm. electricity in the world. The current uh, market price of uh, the current merchant price of electricity is around uh, 10 cents per kilowatt hour in Korea, and uh, like uh, even in the in the globe, it's uh, five to 15 cents per kilowatt hour. But uh, the two three weeks ago, the uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, you know, built a solar you know solar farm. With the one cent per kilowatt hour, that that is a uh, you know the currently lowest one. So I think uh, if uh, solar uh, or wind uh, uh, kind of energy penetrates much to the grid, then the uh, all the electricity price should be kind of lower, less than like uh, five cents or three cents like that. Then we may use such cheap, in the, in, cheap electricity to make green hydrogen. Meaning that that's the starting point of green hydrogen and hydrogen economy. So, so I think uh, that is that uh, can be opportunity. So in short, the, the for for companies, the RE100 or carbon net zeros can be a big threat. But if we win the the threat, then uh, we're gonna enjoy the, uh, the the huge opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very thank you very much, uh, Mr. Cha. Uh, for sharing Hana Kyuse's successful experience of uh, job creation uh, and commercial benefits, because you clearly mentioned that renewable energy is not expensive anymore, and also uh, when you invest in renewable energy, you can get uh, benefits more than your investment in fossil fuels, and also if you invest in renewables, uh, you can create more jobs. So thank you for sharing uh, the experience. And I would like to invite LG Chemical, LG Chemistry this time. So Madam Ini Jung, uh, we are interested in hearing about LG Chem's sustainability and climate neutrality strategy, which was announced in July last year. So LG Chem is the first Korean chemical company who declared such an ambitious plan. So if you share your company's strategy and how to achieve that ambition, it will be very, very appreciated. Please. Very happy to share LG Chem's uh, sustainability strategy, but let me just start by introducing what LG Chem does in its business area. I think most of you might, be, um, might have heard of LG Chem for its battery business arm, but the battery business arm actually has been spun off 
in December 2020, and it's now LG Energy Solutions. So it's a separate company, although it's a subsidiary of LG Chem. So what that leaves LG Chem with three main business areas. The biggest is the petrochemical business unit, where we basically produce plastics. Um, and the second is the advanced materials, uh, where they also make some battery materials, a cathode uh, materials that we actually then supply to LG Energy Solutions, but also engineering uh, materials just such as polycarbonate, uh, IT materials and other semiconductor materials that actually goes into those kind of uh, end products. We have a small business area in life sciences, which basically uh, takes care of primary care and specialty care and, and aesthetics. It's a small uh, business unit, but I think we're now trying to grow it given the uh, aging population where uh, medicine and life sciences is taking uh, a bit of an important role. So our main focus on our sustainability journey is basically a petrochemical business unit and of course advanced ma materials unit. Now, Hanno QCL, I think, is in a very much more advantageous position because it's part of a sort of a clean uh, technology uh, and a green industry, whereas LG Chem, we're on a bit of a double whammy here. We are very energy intensive, and then we, pl we produce plastics. So it's, it's a bit of a double whammy situation where we are now faced with the, uh, the climate neutral uh, growth or climate neutrality by 2050, and then there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of concern about plastic waste worldwide. Um, so yes, yeah, so that's the situation that we are facing. So but in, in, uh, in 2019, um, a new CEO came on board and uh, I think he really understood that uh, to, be, um, you know, to be existing in about 10, 15, 20, 25, 50 years time, we really have to put sustainability at the heart of the corporate strategy. So with this, uh, over the last two years, especially in 2019, I think there's been a lot of uh, soul searching and um, the company has undergone a sort of a, uh, a facelift, a revamping of, of their like core vision. And one of the vision has become sustainability. So that has to be now part of the, uh, the core vision and uh, strategy of the company. Just to explain a little bit about what that is, to unpack a bit, this is quite conceptual, you see, because in 2019, people were trying to see, okay, so what does, what does sustainability mean? What does climate neutrality mean for companies such as LG Chem, where a big part of revenue stream comes from petrochemical products? Um, so that's, this is sort of a, 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 in 2019, I think they've undergone, we've undergone a, some sort of a soul searching exercise within the company to really unpack what that means for a company like L LG Chem. And came up with a huge, you know, three big concepts. Obviously, sustainability means profit, means environment, means society. So profit, obviously, it's linked to the customer. So we need to really lead sustainable innovation for our customers. And I think it's been mentioned by Dr. Kim and, of course, uh, uh, Mr. Cha that, uh, you know, stakeholder management. Well, the biggest stakeholder for a company is our customers. And it's been a customer requirement over the last couple of years. So the, big, the first wave of, uh, of companies like Apple, you know, like um, Microsoft, they've already actually been on the bandwagon of, of climate neutrality. And then, you know, their suppliers, and LG Chem is one of them because we supply plastics to the likes of Microsoft. Um, and, you know, they're now requesting the suppliers to become climate neutral or, you know, low carbon. So to meet that, we had to then look into circular economy issues, looking into, like, environmental protection through waste minimization efforts, et cetera. Um, of course, the climate change, climate action has become a major global uh, imperative, and hence climate action and renewable energy is something that we, had, we thought that we have to really look into as well. And stakeholder, uh, um, stakeholder, one of the biggest stakeholders is also the society. Um, and then for us, responsible supply chains. So when, when that, this comes in because of the battery materials, because in the batteries, as, as, as you're aware, cobalt is one of the main uh, elements that get in, go into the battery manufacturing process. And uh, cobalt has uh, been mainly mined in DRC, the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, where a lot of child labor issues have, have, have arisen. So responsible supply chain actually for us is actually targeting very much at the battery, metals and mineral um, sourcing. But at the same time, you know, we want to also try and uh, green our procurement uh, uh, chain, supply chain, in order for our products to be also green. Then we can supply our products to our customers who are also requesting greener products. So. Out of the, the strategy items, we identified uh, five core areas, and we are now prioritizing on circular economy, 
climate action, and of course a big part of climate action is renewable energy. So this is in a nutshell our, our climate, uh, our sustainability strategy. Now how are we getting there is something that we've been working on since about maybe 20, beginning of 2020. We've announced going carbon neutral by 20, carbon neutral growth by 2050, not carbon neutral yet. Although I think we might actually be maybe on track for carbon neutrality by 2050. But at the moment, it's carbon neutral growth by 2050. And what that means is that we'll be just, uh, we'll keep the levels, our carbon emission levels to 2019 levels when we get to 2050. So our 2019 carbon emission levels has been uh, 10 million tons of carbon per year. And we expect, if business as usual, about four, 40 million tons of carbon will be emitted. So to, to, to just kind of maintain the levels of 10 million, we have to reduce 30 million carbon emissions equivalent in 20, uh, you know, yearly. So this is something that we have committed to. And as you know, we know the petrochemical business is very, very energy intensive. I've been to one of the you know, NAFTA cracking centers actually, and a huge amount of uh, energy is used. And of course, a huge amount of CO2 is, is emitted. So how are we going to be? How are we going to actually? How are we going to actually achieve that uh, goal of carbon neutral growth by 2050? I think I want to go to the previous slide. Um, we're looking at two big options. Oh, well, actually, the, the big strategy is reduce as much as possible. Right, that should be the first step. And then uh, we have signed up to the RE100. So all the electricity that we're using, we want to go 100% uh, re uh, renewable energy. Re renewable power. So that's the second option. And the remainder we will offset through uh, using uh, carbon credits. Um, but on that point, um, that reminds me of uh, pre uh, President Chair's um, remarks on the adaptation issue. Because we're focusing so much on mitigation, we are now looking at maybe purchasing credits from adaptation projects like Red Plus, etc., in countries that we operate, like Indonesia, for example. So we're still sort of. Um, we're still debating and on the compensation offset side, but we're really focusing now on the reduction and the RE100, which is the um, uh, using 100% uh, renewable power. But on the reduction, let me just quickly go through the reduction. Energy efficiency has been um, something that has been very challenging to do because I think energy efficiency, we have reached uh, quite a limited um, capacity, I mean limited, there's very little room for further energy efficiency in, in companies, uh, in Korean companies. So what we're trying to do now is continue upgrading to high ener uh, energy efficiency equipment. And then we're trying to optimize our processes so that any energy lost during the, the process can be also reduced. Um, because of the DX is actually digital transformation. With the ICT being uh, of a very strong point in the Korean uh, in, in Korea, we, we want to use the digital, the ICT technology to see how we can measure and manage uh, elect, uh, energy and electricity more efficiently. And then, of course, we want to uh, transition to low or non-carbon fuels. And an example uh, is that also at LG Chem operations, you know, we're trying to go for either a, a carbon-free or very low-carbon fuel in our operations. So this is something that we are focusing on right away, and this is something that can be done. In, in a short period of time. Um, what need requires a longer period of time and, and a lot of investment is the carbon capture and utilization. I think the ambassador uh, from the US embassy mentioned that, uh, something about technology and innovation. Now, carbon capture and utilization. Uh, I remember hearing about CCUS, which is also the storage, about 10, 15 years ago even. Um, but it hasn't really been commercialized yet. And it's very, very expensive to commer commercialize this technology. So what we're trying to um, propose is for sort of a partnership to get this CCU up and running. Because with the carbon capture utilization technology, we can actually capture carbon during especially our NAFTA cracking process, which could then be then, you know, used for uh, as an input to making CO2 plastic products. So we're kind of looking into that issue right now and seeing how we can reduce carbon reduction from this particular technology. Another technology we're looking very closely is electric electrically heated steam cracker because the steam cracker is where a lot of the energy is used, and we are currently using uh, a ca you know, carbon-intensive energy fuel um, fuel sources to do this. But if we use electricity that is powered by renewable energy, then the steam cracker would actually be having zero carbon emission. So this is something uh, is at their pilot phase right now, and we want to introduce an electric furnace by 2025. So these are some of the more longer-term goals. Um, and then, of course, renewable energy 100%, which has been you know, talked about a lot. 
just to quickly, uh, so uh, what about RE100? We, we've announced it, we've signed up to it, so what are you doing about it? Well, we already have uh, RE100 uh, facilities overseas, I, one in Michigan, another in, in Poland. Uh, the Polish one is, uh, they, they mainly produce battery, battery materials and batteries, so en LG Energy Solution has operations there, and Michigan also. So they are RE100 and they're 100% renewable energy powered. Also recently in Wuxi, China, we have uh, um, also uh, done a p power purchase agreement for a renewable energy power to be supplied to the facility. So overseas, by 2030, we want to go 100% renewable. And domestic uh, plants, which we have many, by, by 2050. And, and in Korea, it's very, very challenging because although companies want to go RE100, the grid is not green. And we're, we're getting 100% or nearly 100% from Kepco. Uh, so it's very, very urgent for the Korean government to really re re you know, green the electricity system, the energy system, for companies in Korea to become RE100. But they have, I think, you know, steps are underway because I think the PPA uh, policy has been revised um, and it will come into force. It will be more effective, coming effect in May this year. So there are some, uh, there are some movements, but still, you know, it, the electricity market is not uh, completely um, liberalized and there are some limitations. So to go RE100 in Korea, the, the, the energy mix has to be greener. And I think uh, Dr. Kim mentioned that only 30, I think, yeah, 19%, 17% is renewable energy. Actually, according to the data I've seen, 13% in 2020 were renewable energy from Korea. The rest is obviously carbon uh, concentrated energy. Next slide. So yeah, I think that's the main issue. And then I guess the, the other pillar that we're looking at is the circular economy of things. Uh, I don't know if, Jen, you have a, another question uh, on the product side of things, but if one element is carbon neutrality or decarbonization, another element for us is circ circular economy because of the plastic use that we, the plastics that we produce. And we are trying to re, um, reuse the plastics through collecting them, mechanically recycling it, and making uh, similar products from used plastic. So that's another issue that I may maybe deal with. Any other questions on that? Okay, good. Thank you very much, Inhi, um, for sharing uh, ambitious plan by LG, LG Chem to achieve sustainability. Uh, by the way, uh, the ambitious targets and goals expressed by two companies can be achieved with strong innovation and technology development. Therefore, I would like to invite uh, the Ms. Lee from GTC, Green Technology Center, so GTC is an organization specially focusing on green technology development. Although Korean government announced uh, its strong commitment to achieve uh, carbon neutrality by 2050, there are people who believe that it's very, very challenging. And as already expressed by uh, Mr. Cha and Madam Chung, technology development may be, it will be a key to achieve their ambitious goals. So please share what GTC is doing, particularly in supporting green business development in Korea. What is GTC's perspective to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050 in Korea? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for inviting such a great uh, 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 today. My name is Sukyung Lee. I'm a uh, senior researcher from Green Technology Center. Just briefly on the, uh, to let you know about my center and then what's the relationship between the government side and then our center. We are the Ministry of Science and the ICTs under the supervision so far. But um, 10 years ago, we are uh, operating, I mean, we literally born together with the GGGI and then GC GCF as well, because based on the green growth policy. But, uh, but then several years later, the Green Technology Center, we are dealing with the technology things. So the, mm, as, as I understand it, technology is very crucial in the government side. So this is decided by the government side that our center is organized and then originated from the government side. So we are the policy center accompanied with the 24 different R&D center, which is uh, also, which are un uh, under supervision from the Ministry of Science and ICT. So, uh, for example, the 
uh, fundamental uh, institution or science uh, infrastructure center and then canister center, whatever, they uh, actually uh, invented the uh, R&D, the research things, and then they invented something patent uh, related to the techniques. Then that one is uh, uh, also communicated and then cooperated together with uh, like a private sector is there to come and then Hana sell or other big companies or all the small enterprises. But um, from our side, we are the policy and then R&D center. So we are this one of the con uh, bridging, uh, con uh, bridging center to communicate between the scientific uh, groups and then the government side. And then we are communicating, uh, help to communicate it, and then to introduce the our, what kind of uh, originate and then unique um, uh, the outcomes and then products in terms of the scientific ways from the government side and then other uh, developing countries, especially for the developing countries. Currently, based on our uh, Korea's uh, brand images, that is mu much a lot of uh, developing countries is uh, knocking the door, and then they ask to the, our government side to help them, especially for the technology transferring and then communicating and then boosting together to make uh, a, a good business uh, opportunity, like introducing like a SME or the startup company or the um, like a big uh, companies next to me like this. So that that's our uh, um, actually we are doing right now. So the two pillars we are working on it. The first thing is uh, analyzing and then ad advising to the government side to making the good policy in terms of the climate change and then carbon neutrality. The second thing is the cooperation. Cooperation between the developing and the developed country and also the, uh, the entities like a GDGI, like a U international organizations and then UN bodies and then some other uh, private sectors and, and then NGOs like that. So that's our job. And then the second question is, so what is the strategy from the Korean side? Um, I have not much time that I, uh, in they, that I heard from today, so I did not bring my uh, presentation files, so I just uh, memorized, and then I just, uh, I just uh, make some uh, the short notes, uh, what kind of the strategy from the Korean side. Uh, the Korea submitted uh, recently low emission development strategy to UNFCCC, and then probably this year we will gonna uh, we will submit uh, updated NDC to the UNFCCC. I hope, and then it, it is very much pressure to the government side. But as uh, Chung, Ms. Chung and then Ms. Ch Mr. Chow already said, it, this is uh, we have to we we cannot. Um, avoided the target of the 2050 carbon neutrality. So probably government decided freely, freely, freely uh, up and then uh, submit the NDC of that. The under such a vision, the Korea's long-term strategy is built upon five key elements that will guide the country's policy making, social transformation and technological innovations to become carbon neutral. These are five elements. Already you guys uh, mentioned about that, but um, th this is also included in the, pro uh, the, government uh, the government side. The first thing is that increasing the use of clean and sustainable energy resources such as solar, wind, and hydrogen. The second thing is uh, improving energy efficiency. For example, the using smart energy management system. We are very much putting a lot of resources and technology things to support, to develop, and then innovate to this kind of the activities to support them. The third one is promoting the deployment of carbon removal and other innovative technologies. Yes, uh, yes, you, uh, Ms. Chung already said it, carbon offsetting thing is still controversial things like uh, planting trees is really um, observing the carbon, uh, the re removal, the GHG emissions, and then this is the addition, this is the re actual the things is the additionality in terms of the G, uh, GHG emission reduction thing. But we have to do that. So kind of that work is also included there. The fourth one is improving industrial sustainability while having its backbone within in the circular economy concept. Uh, two days I got a news from the uh, radio that eight 
times bigger our countryside compared to the plastic uh, wastement, which is a huge plastic wastement we have to can, can we have to handle, but we don't have uh, any solution because not many people to allow the waste management um, the the digging site digging site in, in front of my uh, house something like that. We have uh, not enough the capacity of the uh, treatment of the waste, including those uh, plastic things. But anyhow, we have to solve. We have. We need to solve this. So I think it's the only way to develop the, some kind of technology things to treat, and then using uh, like upcycling or recycling this plastic things. The last thing is uh, increasing the current sequestration efficiency by managing current things. That is by the key elements that I understood from the government decided to you know, uh, uh, launch in the long-term strategy. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Lee. Uh, due to the time limit, unfortunately, I don't think I can go to the second round of discussion. However, as a final discussion, I would like to invite Dr. Kim. So P4G Summit is going to be held next month in Korea. P4G Summit is the first so-called multilateral sustainability summit meeting hosted by Korea. And uh, P4G is quite inspiring, um, inspiring, P4G inspiring platform because not only government, but also private sector and uh, uh, investors, they all work together to achieve sustainable goals and green growth. So, and also there is a huge hope that P4G Summit must be a strong stepping stone to the success of COP26. Therefore, from your view, briefly, Dr. Kim, what do you think P4G leaders should agree next month? Um, it's, as a private sec sector expert, um, I'm not sure about the, the exact contents of the agreement, but. I can tell you, let's put it this way. Um, I think, the, as you said, the P4G uh, can be a um, very important stepping stone for COP26 from ambition perspective. So I would like to, I think that um, there are two, um, the signals that P4G can send uh, as a spe stepping stone for COP26 from ambition perspective or, or stakeholder, um, the joining perspective. The first one is the developing countries perspective. Mm -hmm. Since the, the P4G, uh, the summit, I, 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 I think there are more developing country leaders will be there than the developed countries. So it's, it's a good time to listen to what they are asking because we have to, they have to join us for, for the more ambition, um, more ambitious, the COP26 to be sustainable for, for the COP. Um, so I think it's a good, uh, good momentum or good event, if you like, to, to get their view and, 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 and um, to reflect their, their perspective into the stepping stone. The second one is the private sector. To send a very clear signal, but it's not just short-term signal. We, the private sector leaders, all know the short-term signal. But as I said, we don't know the speed, meaning we don't know the the continuity, and we don't know the the when we kick in. So if you just can give us very clear long-term signal, so that we can decide or estimate the speed of the change, then it will be very helpful for us to uh, decide where to invest in, where to kick in. Thank you. Thank you, very, thank you very much, Dr. Kim. So developing countries on board and very clear signal to the private, very clear long-term signal to the private sector with the speed of the spin. Those two messages, I hope the leaders will agree uh, in May here in Seoul. So because of time, I think I have to bring this uh, panel discussion to the end. Thank you very much for all panelists for sharing your thoughts. Anyway, in five hours, there will be a climate summit hosted by a uh, US president. And next month, there will be P4G summit 
So as uh, Dr. Kim already presented, there will be series of international events to raise the ambition uh, regarding carbon neutrality. And also private sectors are very actively responding. I mean, private sectors actually, in some sense, they are leading the global efforts. So I uh, would like to uh, say, I would like to congratulate the great achievements by Korean companies. And I wish all of you to make a great success continuously. So thank you very much for coming and I'm, I hope all of you have a very nice afternoon and good morning, thank you. Thank you very much, Jenny. And now this comes to the end of the program. So uh, we would like to wrap up the program, the high level business round table here. So thank you very much for your participation and we hope to see you again and happy Earth Day everyone. Thank you very much.